Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yankel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm, shalomhill.org. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. I have always loved butterflies. My first four years of grade school were spent at a country school out in the middle of prairie and farm fields. We spent many a recess chasing and catching butterflies, which we took in to the teacher to identify for us. Even now, so many years later, Tom and I still plant flowers that will attract butterflies so we can ooh and ah whenever they come to visit. Today on Prairie Yard and Garden, let's go see a lady that takes the love of butterflies, especially monarchs, to a whole new level. Last week, I decided to pick a bouquet of flowers. There were two kinds of coreopsis, um, a purple coneflower, and swamp milkweed, all blooming so into the vase they went. That was Thursday, and the flowers sat right near the kitchen sink so we could enjoy them every day. On Sunday, we had a nice big caterpillar on the flower bouquet right in our kitchen. We were raising a monarch. Today we are visiting with Janelle Goldenstein of Hancock, Minnesota, who raises monarchs all the time. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Mary. How did you get started raising monarchs? It actually happened when I was probably 12 years old. We moved to a farm, which for a city girl was amazing. Critters everywhere. I remember one day we would go out in the road ditches on the farm and there was these fat yellow and black caterpillars. I run, run into the house and say, Dad, you know, what is this? Oh, just what, you got to keep those in a, in a jar. You'll just love it. They'll turn into a butterfly. So we poke some holes in the pickle jar lid and go out there, run and find a stick, four or five milkweed leaves, put them in the jar and take the caterpillar home. You know, they were big by then. So I a week later, we had a chrysalis. That was the best thing. It got me hooked for life. How do you know when to start looking for eggs because you collect mm -hmm. eggs i believe we do now yep when i was a kid like i said it was just the caterpillars but now we know we follow the migration there's a map on um, monarchwatch.org i believe it's called and they have a map that tracks it from mexico so we kind of time it to the end of may and then we know we go out and look for eggs right away when they start popping up they're about four inches tall at that point we always find them it's gotten over the past couple of years it's just kind of an instinct you have this feeling it got to be about time and we go check and sure enough there's eggs. A lot of times you don't see the monarchs first, you, you just find the eggs. Does it have to be a certain temperature um, about till you can start looking for them? I, you know, does it have to get like 50 degrees during the day or um, and the snow has to be melted? Oh or? definitely no snow, yep. And it usually is about yeah, 68 to 70 when you first start finding them. Okay. It's that first nice warm week that we get, it seems to bring them with it, so. You had mentioned a while ago, before we were on camera, that um, you, the female monarch, mm -hmm. you see them actually fluttering and you could tell. Yes. How do you know? 
Well, it's uh, it's things I've learned online. Mostly, I'm I'm in some butterfly groups and things like that. And there's science websites that you can go to and learn. But it's so fun. They'll you'll watch the the mom walk, fly around to each different plant. They taste with their feet. That's where their taste receptors are. And when they find the milkweed, they'll stop and choose a spot, and she'll touch her abdomen to the leaf and then lay an egg. Janelle, what part of the plants do the monarchs lay their eggs on? Most often it's the leaves, um, usually the bottom, but sometimes the top. But um, in the summer especially, they really like the milkweed flower buds. They hide their eggs in there. You'll find two or three at a time often. And I think it's because they really like the spots where the caterpillars can hide more. That's my kind of idea and opinion on it. Do they lay their eggs on the bottom leaves or the top leaves, or do you notice a difference at all? I feel like earlier in the season, it's usually on the bottom leaves. And then towards the end of the summer, it seems more towards the top. And my thoughts on that is because the top leaves are gonna be more tender and better for the young caterpillars. That makes sense. Yeah. And is there a specific um, type of plant that they like? Um, usually just milkweed. That's the only thing the caterpillars can eat is milkweed. So it's really important to their survival. Um, you know, the adult butterflies like all sorts of pollinator plants, but for the caterpillars, you really need milkweed. Wow, that's good to know. So after you find an egg, how long does it take for that egg to hatch? Um, it's about three to five days. Uh, when it's hot outside, it's a little bit less. When it's chillier out, say 60 degrees, 65, it's usually five days. And can you tell when they're getting close to hatching? You sure can. The uh, eggshell turns from a solid white to a more opaque. You can kind of see through it. If you have a really good lens, you can get up close and see the little black head of the caterpillar through the top. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty neat. <laughs> and then after they hatch, they be turn into a tiny caterpillar? Oh yeah, just it's so tiny. It's almost the size of the egg. And they'll actually turn around and eat their eggshell and then go off and munch little circles on the leaves. So it's real easy to find the newborn caterpillars because you'll see the circles on the milkweed leaves. I have heard the term instar used in referring to the caterpillars. What does that mean? It's hard to explain exact measurements, but you'll notice about a quarter inch to a half inch being second instar. Then they'll double in size and be third. And then a little bit larger fourth and then the big giant milkweed caterpillars that we all know and love are the fifth instar. How long do they stay in that caterpillar stage? Um, it's about two weeks, sometimes 10 days. Just as I said before with eggs, it's mostly temperature based. They go faster when it's hot and slower when it's cool. So, okay, we get to be a nice, fat, big caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Then what happens to them? Then they do what we call the wander. They wander away. Um, if they're wild and outside, you won't often see them because they'll go hide so well. Some of them have been known to go 10 feet even more to find a spot to hide. They'll usually go under a leaf or, you know, under an overhang on your side of your house or a chair, whatever they can find, and they'll do what's called a J. They'll hang, they'll spin a silk button and hang from it and look like a J shape. And they'll do that for about 24 hours and then they shed their skin and underneath is the green chrysalis. So mm -hmm. That's 10 to 14 days also. I find it's closer to 10 to 12, but they do say 10 to 14 if you ask an expert on it. Do they eat while they're in that stage? No, nope, they don't. They um, And it's actually interesting because their whole, the whole inside of the caterpillar rearranges itself to turn itself into the butterfly. So it's, I'm assuming they have some sort of food store that they save for that time. And that's just, they just turn into the chrysalis. There's this thing that at the top of the chrysalis that it's like an accordion. And that will be the first thing you'll notice. So that's probably an hour that they'll pop that loose and you'll see like an air separation there. And then you'll notice that they'll start to bust open the bottom of the chrysalis. The butterflies head down at that point and it will pop it open and slide right out in seconds. It, it's really fast and they'll hang on and spin themselves around and inflate their wings. So can they fly right away then when they come out of the chrysalis? No, they can't. And it usually takes about four hours if, till their wings are dry and solid till they can fly. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so they're probably pretty vulnerable at that time. They are really, and it, you know, it's we've had some in my years of doing this that have fallen and their wings get crinkled and then they can't fly. So it's really important that they have a safe spot. You raise monarchs. Mm -hmm. Why is it important to actually bring them in and raise them? 
Monarchs have so many predators in the wild. There are tachnid flies. They lay their eggs on the caterpillar and eat it from the inside out. There is wasps, things that can lay their um, eggs inside them also. There's also wasps that attack chrysalises. There are spiders, um, stink bugs, so many things. I mean, there's, it's just birds even. I mean, there are so many things that could eat them. So they have a better survival rate then if you can bring them in yeah. and grow them and then release them into the wild. Yes, they say on average in the wild it's three to five percent that live. So if a female lays, you know, a hundred eggs, that's only a couple that live out of those eggs in the wild. So I feel like it's really important to help out a little bit and not only is it fun to raise them, but you're helping them out a little bit. Would you be willing to show us the plants that you look on to see if you can find eggs? Absolutely, sure. Well, Mary, I wanted to show you swamp milkweed. This is specifically a plant that it seems the little caterpillars like. Um, here is an example of a monarch egg on top of a leaf here. And here we have some eggs in the buds. So you see that they nestle right down in there. It's kind of neat. Yes, it is. I thought they always had to be on the bottom. I but know. Not at all. Nope. And then here we even have an example of the little circles in the leaves I was talking about earlier. Right. And here is a little first star, first instar caterpillar there. My gosh, look how tiny he is. Yeah, and he's a couple days old, so he's actually twice the size as when they come out of the egg. How can you tell that he's a couple days old? It's just trial, from, really just from doing this for so long, you can tell. They, you see the stages, how they grow, how fast they grow, and that's just wisdom, I suppose. Is, are <laughs> they that color right away? Nope, when they first come out, they're see-through, almost white, um, and with a little black head. So they don't get their stripes for the first couple days, or until a couple days later. So would that be considered the first instar? Mm -hmm. That's us. Oh, yep. okay. All right. We also have another guy up here. If we can find him. Oh, I see one here. Yeah, right here. He's just about second instar. If you can see him right there. Yes. Yes. And you knew that they were here because you saw holes. Yep. It's a classic sign for a newborn caterpillar. You see the holes in the leaves. They tend to prefer the center of the leaf, whereas the older caterpillars, you'll notice that they eat from the outside in on the leaves, if that makes sense. So they eat and live on the milkweed. Milkweed, only milkweed. That's the only thing monarchs eat. But this is kind of toxic to some other insects and mm -hmm. creatures, isn't it? Yep, I've heard that there are some animals that are sensitive to it, although the rabbits seem to like it plenty, but... <laughs> <laughs> but yes, and other, other caterpillars really don't eat it. There is, every now and then you'll see a certain kind of moth. I'm not real sure what the species is, but they will eat it. But otherwise, nothing else, you know, it's toxic to most things, and the only thing that really eat it is monarchs. So then, will you, when you find eggs mm -hmm. or caterpillars, mm -hmm. when do you take them into the house or put them into your your housing for them. Okay, well, we, I used to take all stages of caterpillars. Um, we ended up having a lot of losses because of the tachnid flies that I talked about earlier. So you won't know that they have laid eggs on the caterpillar. And then, so it's kind of sad for the kids and for us. So we decided this year that we just take eggs. So as soon as we find an egg, we'll usually wait 24 hours for it to harden because they're quite soft when she first lays them. So after 24 hours, we take them in and we rinse them off with cold water and we'll put them in a Tupperware container with a plain white paper towel. You can't have anything on it, no, no, you know, the soap ones that are out now. You can't have that, just plain. And we put them in there and seal the lid and we open it once a day to let air in. And in three to five days, you have a new hatchling. Do you actually scrape the egg off of the leaf or you take the whole leaf and take it in with the egg on there? That's a good question. Um, some people like to take the eggs off, we'll scrape them off. Um, that's my method, I take part of the leaf. I'll usually, if it's a small leaf like this, I would take the whole leaf in. Um, if it's a bigger leaf, like say one of these, and it was towards the edge, I would cut around 
and just take a segment of it. That way you still have plenty of milkweed out here for the caterpillars that we miss, like the couple we've seen here. So they can still survive and then we can raise the ones we want in, in the uh, entryway. How often do you have to do that? When we collect them, we take them in the house. Um, we give them a good rinse under cold water, uh, dry them off a little bit and put them on a clean paper towel in a Tupperware container. Can you show us what you do or where you put them after that? Sure. I have a question. What plants do you recommend for starting a butterfly garden? What we want to do is, of course, we're attracting the butterflies, and we want to do it for a, a long period of time. A lot of native prairie plants, because they're uh, easy to take care of, they're adapted to our climate, and they require a minimum of watering. Oh, early in the season, we'll have butterfly weed, which is a milkweed. The milkweeds are important plants for the monarch butterfly and that'll get some uh, blooms early in the summer. Then uh, we'll go into uh, Rebecca's, which are uh, like Black-Eyed Susan, Brown-Eyed Susan. That'll get the, a little later in the season. And then uh, I would, you wanna cover the late summer, early fall, and that's when the, the butterflies, you know, the monarchs are getting ready to migrate and they're feeding heavily. And then we'll get asters. There's many varieties of aster, but there's uh, you know over 100 varieties of asters you could use. And then the goldenrod, which uh, like the aster has many many varieties. And then uh, you know the latest uh, members of the sunflower family. I would uh, plant some of those. They'll be late in the season. You know, just uh, think of the bloom times and try to cover a lot of the season so that you can take care of the butterflies when they need the nectar. So we just encourage planting a lot of flowers on your property as much as you can to take care of the butterfly and all the other pollinators. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Here is my setup I wanted to show you. Um, as we talked about before, when I take the eggs in, we take them in, rinse them off, and put them in a Tupperware. This one's actually Ziploc, but tomato, tomato. Um, we, put, we, after, we put the leaves in here after we rinse. You can see here's an egg on the top of the leaf and an egg on the bottom of one. Two different types, too. This is swamp that's common. And here we have a guy who's about a day old. I don't know if the camera can even see him, but he is tiny. So we leave the caterpillars even after they hatch in here for about a week until we can actually you know see them well enough that they're not going to get lost. When you rinse them those eggs are so tiny how do they not rinse off of the leaf? <laughs> the first time I did it I had a bowl underneath in the water because I was so worried about it but they're actually <laughs> glued on pretty well it's actually really hard to get them off and I think that's just nature's way of making sure they're not, they're not going to go anywhere. I suppose because if there's a rain, they can't wash off in right? the rain either. Yep. Okay, so do you wet the paper towel at all before you put the leaves in? That's a good question. I usually do not because when you put the leaves in there after rinsing, they get the paper towel just slightly damp. And then this holds in moisture really well, which is part of the reason you use the Tupperware because you want the eggs and the leaves not to dry out. Okay, good to know. So there's that. After a week or two, um, when they're big enough, we put them in a critter carrier. <laughs> These guys in here are actually pretty big. I, I didn't have any second instars to show you, but I wanted to show you how we just same paper towel. Um, that guy's about a third right there. And then fourth instar here as he's munching away on that leaf. What is the white that's on these leaves? I can see. Mm -hmm. It's actually the milky sap from the, the milkweed is actually what that is. Um, okay. I tend to take whole plants and then break them in half. So you'll get milkweed sap quite everywhere. Looks like paint. Yeah, it does kind of. <laughs> so they're in here for about 10 days. Um, when they turn to be fifth instar, which is their final instar, we put them in these mesh pop-ups. 
We put the milkweed in here for them. We do a cup sometimes when it's really hot. Here you can see the big guy. Wow. Yeah, he's, he's about ready. So we do, they're in here for, you know, a week, maybe five days. How often do you put fresh milkweed in here? If you use the cups, you can actually keep it in here for a good five days. It stays pretty fresh. The other way we do it though, um, is by just laying in some leaves in here and that way you have to change it two days two times a day i don't think this oh this does have some oh and there's a little guy that snuck by me look at that third instar compared to the fifth isn't that neat to see the size yes, difference yes that is so cool but Sneaky. <laughs> now how often do you have to change the bottom because they litter yep um, they do have a lot of frass, that's true. The frass is caterpillar poop. Um, so we do change the bottom every couple of days just because you don't want it to get moldy because mold makes them sick, obviously, as it would anyone. And just be, to keep them healthy, you know, and clean like they would be in nature. Try to keep it as similar as possible to what they would be in nature. And when you have them in, the, in these containers, mm -hmm. what temperature do you keep them at? Um, I keep them in an entryway porch area because I like them to stay at the same air temperature as outside. Um, you know, there's studies that have said that maybe raising them indoors could be detrimental. So I just really like keeping them at the same temp to have as close to a natural environment as possible. Okay. So where do they go from here? From here, we, it's kind of hard to see. They will go wander about like you see this guy and this one and they'll spin what's called a silk button at the top of the enclosure, sometimes on the zipper, as you can see over there. Um, and they'll, after about 24 hours, they'll hang upside down by their two hind legs. And for 24 hours, they will hang in a J, and then they'll start to shed their skin um, all of a sudden. It's kind of neat. I, this guy's actually really close. Maybe by the end of the show, you'll get to see that. 24 hours later, they form chrysalises, and I have a couple right here that are out to sea. Um, the one on that left side is pretty fresh. He's a couple days old. The one on the right that you can start to see the pattern wing through, he's uh, four days, five days. So in about a week, he'll come out, or he or she will eat close. How can you tell the difference between a male and a female monarch? Well, Mary, on the male monarchs, on the lower hind wings, they have a dot on each one. They also have thinner black veins on their wings. The female does not have the scent gland dots and they have wider black veins in their wings. Do you um, have to let them get dry and everything before you can release them? Yes, absolutely. Probably four to five hours, um, sometimes a little longer, but most of them, that's all it takes. And then they're fluttering around ready to get out. Do you keep them right in here until you actually release them? Yep, I do. Just right in there and then we go take them right out into the backyard and let them be free. Now, does your family help with raising monarchs? They absolutely do. I have four kids and um, I have one helper in particular whose name is Brady. He has helped me for as long as I can remember finding eggs, um, feeding them. It's, it's a lot of fun, but they all do help. Do you think that we could uh, get Brady involved in telling us what he all does with Absolutely. the raising? Absolutely, you sure can, sure. Great. That'd be great. Brady, it has been so interesting learning how you guys raise monarchs, but your mom said that you help, so tell me what you do. So normally when I go to help my mom with finding eggs and stuff, we usually find caterpillars and we actually have to get at least a bag or two of milkweed per trip just to feed all these caterpillars. When you go, do you find one egg per leaf or sometimes more than that? Um, we usually find one or more. Okay, so I bet you're getting pretty good at actually finding the little caterpillars yep. too. Yep. Then do you help obviously collect the leaves and stuff mm -hmm. and do you help feed them to them yep okay do you have to help clean the pens and the carriers not usually okay i think my mom usually does that okay do you guys tag your monarchs too um yes we do usually at the 
beginning to the end of August. What does that mean? Because some of the people that watch the show might not know what it means to tag monarchs and, and why you do that. Can you tell us? So the reason you have to tag your monarchs is so if someone somewhere else finds that monarch, they can, then they have the number and they can contact you if they found your monarch. So do you each, each family or each person, do you get certain numbers or how will people know or is that on the tag? Um, it's on the tag. The number is usually on the tag and then I think they have to write it down on this piece of paper what number it is and if it, the, the gender and everything to know what like gender it is and what number it is. And that it came from Hancock, Minnesota. Yep. So has anybody found any of the monarchs that you have tagged and reported back to you? Um, not yet. Hopefully down the road that'll happen. We should get your mom back and we can find out a little bit more about the tagging and we can wrap up and find out a little bit more about how other people can do this too. It has been so interesting that you and your family are able to raise the monarchs. If somebody else wants to raise monarchs, what would you recommend? I would say the most important thing they're gonna need is milkweed, lots of milkweed. Um, also get some nectar plants for the adult butterflies. You're gonna wanna attract them and be able to sustain them also. And the milkweed flowers don't last the whole season, so cone flowers, um, black-eyed Susan, um, gosh, what else? We got wild uh, sunflowers like I have back here. Some of those things that are nectar plants that have a lot for the butterflies are really important. So those are good food sources for the adults. Yes. That even as you release them, they can feed right. to get ready for the long trip down yes. to Mexico. Perfect, exactly. Thank you both so much for letting us come and for teaching us all about raising monarchs. It's been fun, thank you. I'm glad you came. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm, shalomhill.org. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs.